Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., as we host an author series program tonight with Dr. Fawaz Jirgis, who is the author of the book, Obama in the Middle East. My name is Bill Kepler. I'm the International Affairs Director at the Council, an institution truly where learning happens. We're very proud to provide a neutral forum for education, discussion, and debate. As we look around the world today, there is absolutely no shortage of trouble spots, and yet, uh, when you look around, you see President Obama, despite his pivot in focus of U.S. military and national security uh, strategic focus away from the Middle East and the Near East, it really is the Middle East that continues to command global attention, be it the ongoing, unresolved Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, the trouble in Syria, the process of democratization in Egypt. And most importantly and of greatest concern is, the, is Iran's perceived, I want to stress perceived, development of a nuclear weapons program. The United States, despite its diminished influence, will continue to play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics and seeking successful resolutions in the Middle East, preferably using diplomatic means. As the Commander-in-Chief, President Barack Obama, and his national security force lead the effort in defining uh, and implementing U.S. engagement in the re region. Given this, what is President Barack Obama's Middle East policy? How well is it understood and being executed? And most importantly, after three years, what have been the outcomes? To answer these burning questions, we're very fortunate tonight to have a very renowned Middle East scholar and the author of the book, Obama in the Middle East, Dr. Fawaz Jurgis, who will attempt to share his insights and give us perspectives on these issues. Dr. Jurgis is a professor of Middle Eastern politics and international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he also obtained his Master of Science degree. He recently acquired the Emirates Chair of Contemporary Middle East and is the director of the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics. Dr. Gerges has taught at Oxford, Harvard, and Columbia Universities, and was a research scholar at Princeton University, and is, holds the chair of the Christian A. Johnson in the Middle Eastern Studies and International Affairs at Sarah Lawrence College. Dr. Gerges has interviewed hundreds of civil society leaders, activists, and mainstream and radical Islamists throughout the Muslim world, including the Muslim community in Europe. His articles and editorials routinely appear in very prominent journals, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the International Herald Tribune, Public Affairs, Public Policy. He also is a regular on uh, numerous media organizations throughout the world, uh, where he's been interviewed uh, on the major networks in the United States, CNN, MSNBC, BBC, and Al Jazeera, just to name a few. And for diversity, he's also been on the Charlie Rose Show, where he will be appearing tomorrow. We look forward to his remarks and the questions and answers discussion that will follow his presentation. And now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Fawaz Jerjus. Thank you, Bill, for your Welcome. kind introduction, um, and good evening. Bill mentioned that uh, I have written extensively on American foreign policy in the Middle East and relations between the United States of America and the greater Middle East, uh, including not just the Arab world, but the Muslim world uh, as well. My recent book, Obama and the Middle East, I just want to say a few words about the context of the book so at least you know where I stand. This book, um, and I really stress, uh, it's not a polemical text. It's not really either uh, for or uh, uh, against Barack Obama. 
Uh, I'm a historian by training. Um, I thought I, I studied at Oxford and the LSE and taught at Harvard and all the schools. And I really have gone to a great, I mean, uh, uh, lengths to basically be analytical and fair to the uh, Obama presidency and its approach uh, towards uh, the Middle East. The second point I want to make is that the book itself is not just about the Obama presidency and the Middle East. You cannot write a book. You cannot just say, I want to discuss the Obama presidency and the Middle East. You cannot, uh, uh, you have to contextualize the Obama presidency. And in this particular sense, the book is about American foreign policy towards the Middle East. And where really, where does Obama basically fit within this particular context of American foreign policy? That is, the book really uh, uh, examines examines American foreign policy from the Cold War years to uh, uh, what I call the 9-11 uh, uh, wars uh, culminating in the invasion uh, and occupation uh, of Iraq. And if there is really one point I stress in, in my book, because you cannot discuss the Obama presidency uh, and the Middle East without understanding what I call the bitter inheritance that Barack Obama basically uh, uh, had when he uh, reached the White House. And what I mean by the bitter inheritance, it's not just about the 9-11 wars uh, uh, from, I mean, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq and, and, and the, the current uh, struggle over Pakistan. We're talking about really uh, a bitter inheritance whose roots go back to the Cold War years, the global rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, and what the United States did between 1947 and 9-11 in order to preserve its interest and protect its allies in the Middle East. Let's, let me take just a few minutes to really flesh out what I mean by the uh, bitter inheritance when Barack Obama came to the White House. Multiple wars on multiple fronts. Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, dozens of theaters. The United States was after 9-11, of course, in the pursuit of Al-Qaeda and the global uh, war on, on terror hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of American troops battling in Muslim lands. Again, throughout the world in the pursuit of other uh, Al-Qaeda or what the United States perceived to be allies of Al-Qaeda, local branches and what have you. The United States, between September 9-11 and up to 2008, was basically engaged, not just multiple wars, in a social engineering project, social engineering project that had little to do with its national security interest. It was not just about, I mean, pursuing a war against Al-Qaeda. It was about planting Jeffersonian seeds of democracy in the heart of Arabia. And so regardless of what we think, that's not the question. Regardless of what we think, whether it was good or bad, that's not the question. The question is, we were, we as Americans, we were engaged in a social engineering project that went far and beyond what we call the national in, uh, security interest of the United States. Uh, America's moral standing, and I'm, I'm just, I, I really want to provoke you. America's moral standing suffered a great deal of setback between 9-11. I mean, think the United States of America, the leader of human rights in the world, engaging in torture at home and torture abroad. Think what this particular, I mean, I know as Americans, we, but think of what kind of images, what kind of resonance the behavior of the United States between 9-11 and uh, uh, when Barack Obama came. Uh, in fact, one of the points I show in the book is that both allies and enemies of the United States basically question the idea that the United States was a rational, credible actor that can be trusted to maintain an international balance of power. What I'm trying to say, a revolt was brewing against America's unilateral use of force after 9-11, worldwide, not just in the Middle East. And this particular revolt was brewing, in particular in the part of the world I work on, the greater Middle East, because of the perception, rightly or wrongly, that you know, the United States was basically engaged in a social engineering project, dominating, subjugating, trying to make that part of the world in its own uh, image. And it's not just the moral standing of the United States of America. Again, we're talking about the bitter inheritance. What the bitter inheritance? Think of the costs of the 9-11 wars. Think of the material cost of the 9-11 wars. Between 9-11 
and the present, we, the United States of America, have spent between, and I'm being very precise with numbers here, between three and five trillion dollars in the pursuit of the global war on terror. According to Brown University's economist numbers, the, the numbers are 4.5 trillion dollars in the fight against Al-Qaeda. You might say, so what? We're rich, we can afford it. We go to a casino, we lose 4.5. Uh, it's not just about spending the money, it's about the opportunity costs that come with spending 4.5 trillion dollars in the pursuit, and again, I don't have the time to tell you that Al-Qaeda at the height of its power, that is in the late 1990s, never numbered between 1,000 or 2,000 fighters. We don't know exactly the exact number. There is a consensus that at the height of its power, Al-Qaeda, the organization that perpetrated the uh, insidious crime against America on 9-11, never numbered more than between one and 2,000 fighters. That is, we estimate that we, the United States of America, have spent in the fight against Al-Qaeda as much as we spent in the struggle against the Soviet Union between 1947 and 1980. I mean, I'm not suggesting there is a causal link between this, the money that we have spent uh, um, uh, in the war, in the global war on terror, and America's relative decline. But overall, you have to take it into account because when you're talking about $5 trillion, this is a huge sum of money. I mean, I, I, a, a huge sum of money in particular when it's borrowed uh, from uh, overseas. These, in, in simple terms, really, the where Barack Obama, because before I, I can't really discuss and examine the Barack Obama presidency and the Middle East without giving you at least a very simplistic outline. That is, you cannot dismiss, you cannot ignore the bitter inheritance and how Barack Obama has dealt with the Middle East since he came uh, uh, to power. I think uh, the Obama foreign policy team were fully aware, I would argue, of this particular bitter inheritance, bitter legacy between the United States uh, and the great the Middle East. They were also fully aware they had a vivid sense of America's relative decline vis-a-vis -vis the rising geostrategic and geoeconomic powers in the world, in particular in the Pacific region and in particular in Asia. We're talking about China and India and the various power, Brazil and, 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 and what have you. Uh, one of the major points that really is, is lost on, on when we discuss is that uh, the, the Obama and his advisors uh, were of the opinion that the United States uh, had overextended itself far beyond its, what, uh, its vital uh, security interest demand in the Middle East. That is, uh, uh, there, there was a sense that the United States uh, was too much engaged, too much involved in the shifting sands of the Middle East. Um, a consensus emerged uh, among Barack, I mean, the, the Obama uh, foreign, policy, uh, foreign policy advisors is that America's future does not lie in the Middle East. America's future lies in the Pacific region and Asia, where, I mean, you were talking about uh, South Korea, about uh, China, about India, about Australia, about Japan. Uh, and uh, they also, at the same time, believe that the liberal use of unilateral force was not only misguided, but also was counterproductive to the very idea of promoting democracy. If there is really one fundamental point I really would like you to take uh, out uh, tonight, really one fundamental idea, is that Barack Obama, the Barack Obama foreign policy is deeply anchored within the dominant consensus narrative on foreign policy. That is, I would argue both the left and the right misunderstood Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama is deeply anchored in the dominant consensus narrative on American foreign policy. That is realism. Barack Obama, contrary, because if you, if you listen to uh, Barack Obama's critics on the left and the right, the left is very angry because they expected, they had expected Barack Obama to be what? A transformational president. They had expected Barack Obama to shift and change, radically change American foreign policy. And the right, what does the right say? Barack Obama, look, he's an apologist uh, uh, for the world. He does not really stress uh, what America stands for in terms of values. The reality is Barack Obama, since 2006, he time and again, Barack Obama has stressed that he believes in realism, realism in foreign policy. His models, w, I mean, President Bush Sr. and JFK and even Ronald Reagan, 
he is on record more than once stating that he subscribes to the realist paradigm in international relations. And what does the realist paradigm in international relations uh, say? Collective security, mutual interests, as opposed to basically uh, 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 liberal values, uh, either by force or by uh, persuasion. And one of the major arguments that was basically put on the table by Barack Obama, I don't preach to other nations. Translation, that basically, I don't believe in democracy promotion. It's up to you to find your uh, own political and social and intellectual models. And what he was really trying to say is that if there is one particular underlying principle that underlies the Barack foreign policy, he really wanted to bring American foreign policy back to the days before it was hijacked by the neoconservatives. Uh, uh, really, and what, 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 what he, and, and what he meant by that is that he want basically to anchor American foreign policy in the realist paradigm that dominated the American foreign policy approach between 1947 and 9-11. Uh, uh, A second important point I really would like you to, uh, I mean, take home uh, with you tonight from my book is that uh, the Middle East, contrary to the dominant received wisdom, has never topped Barack Obama's priorities, foreign policy priorities. That is, Barack Obama from day one believed that the United States had, um, uh, I mean, overextended itself in that part of the world. And he believed that America's future lies in the Pacific region and Asia. From day one, this is the reality. Uh, that be he believed that the Middle East, and this is why since really si the, the Barack Obama presidency, the Middle East is not a priority on his foreign policy priority. But the team itself, Barack Obama and his foreign policy team, realized they could not just pack and leave because the United States, what we're talking about, hundreds of thousands of troops basically were battling in Muslim uh, lands. And you're talking about tremendous, I mean, in a way, uh, I mean, relations between the United States and the Muslim world, we were at war. That's the reality. And we were at wars not with Muslim governments. In fact, uh, people in that part of the world viewed the United States as in, in a hostile, in hostile term as uh, an enemy uh, nations. The first priority was to begin the process of reducing the U.S. military footprint in Muslim lands, uh, in particular in Iraq and Afghanistan. They realized that as long as American troops remained in Muslim lands, relations between the United States and the Muslim world would remain hostile and would remain uh, basically uh, at war. The second point, the second, in order to begin the process of mending the rift with the Muslim world and shift U.S. foreign policy, uh, foreign policy priorities elsewhere, they wanted to help broker a peace settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The Obama foreign policy team, in contrast to its predecessor, believe that the Arab-Israeli conflict is the most fundamental fault line, not only between the Palestinians and the Israelis, but between the Muslim world and the United States and the West, on the other hand. And they believe that, uh, and, and of course, Barack Obama was not the only president to say that basically Barack Obama uh, drew a causal link between finding a resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict and America's national security interests not only Barack Obama, even the military. That is, a consensus exists that as long as the Arab-Israeli conflict remains unresolved, basically this particular fault line poisons relations between the United States and the Muslim world and has a direct impact on the security of American soldiers, as General Petraeus uh, testified before the Congress. Very, very important point. The Arab-Israeli conflict, significant, not only because you want to I mean, uh, uh, stop, put an end to the shedding of Jewish and Arab blood, but because America's security interests were involved. Thirdly, a systemic campaign was launched by President Barack Obama in order to shift the debate from the foreign policy field to other questions. Because <coughs> literally, uh, um, when President Bush uh, left office, uh, I mean, the polls we have, I mean, I cite many of the polls, uh, the extent of hostility to the United States was overwhelming, truly. 
the United States head in hand was seen be behind, of course, mainly, I mean, falsely, that's not the question, but the extent of anger and rage in a part of the world against the United States was horrendous, overwhelming. And what Obama and his foreign policy team wanted to do to shift the debate, and what he did was using his own personal story. As an American, some family members, as you know, he went to Cairo and made, you know, not just in Cairo, a series of big speeches starting in Ankara and Cairo and Jakarta, in which the president used his own personal story in order to humanize America to Arabs and Muslims and begin the process of mending the historic rift between America uh, and uh, that part uh, of the world. <coughs> Another point in this particular, I mean, uh, approach, uh, Barack Obama wanted to test the waters with Iran. And what, what he meant by testing the waters, he really wanted to make a public appeal to the Iranian leadership about America's desire for a rapprochement with Iran while maintaining the sanctions against Iran. P I want to come back to it. That is, Barack Obama never wavered from his basically decision to maintain the sanctions on Iran while basically talking softly to the Iranian leadership. He believed that, well, what do I lose? I might be able to basically have a win. I can maintain the sanctions and maintain my options and yet try to make an outreach to the Iranian leadership. And finally, uh, on Al-Qaeda and terrorism, the question was, you hammer away at Al-Qaeda and its local branches. That is, it was a strategic, basically, the, 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 the whole idea, the confrontation against Al-Qaeda uh, was a strategic priority for Barack Obama and his foreign policy team. One of the most important strategic directives by the president, hammer away against Al-Qaeda and its allies and dismantle the entire organization. If there is really one biggest priority that basically, uh, uh, I mean, topped his foreign policy agenda was that Barack Obama told the entire national security apparatus, I want Al-Qaeda organization to be dismantled. I want basically the fight, nothing was basically uh, held back. Literally, uh, and I'll come back to talk about really where are we today in the fight against Al-Qaeda. This is really the context. I mean, I, I just put on the table the context of, you know, the conceptual points. Uh, now, the question is really, what's the verdict? Let's, let's see where are we today and what has Barack Obama achieved in the last three years and a half of his presidency? And I think if there is one particular point I want to make tonight is that the record is very mixed. One of Obama's most important political achievements one of his most important political achievements in the last three years and a half has been the reduction of U.S. military footprint in Muslim lands. It was his priority, and I think to a great extent, Barack Obama has done relatively very well. American troops are out of Iraq. Most, well, all American uniformed troops are out of Iraq, and I think the Iranian, the uh, Afghan uh, mission uh, uh, is being wind uh, down uh, by 2013, 2014, the United States will most likely have very few soldiers in Afghanistan. Now we have 90,000 uh, uh, troops in Afghanistan. Uh, the idea is to bring uh, all American forces from Afghanistan by 2014. Despite the U.S. military's best efforts in the last one year and so to maintain a sizable force in Iraq, as you know, the U.S. military wanted to maintain a sizable force, the Iraqi leadership insisted that if American forces remain in, in Iraq, that basically they will not have legal immunity from uh, Iraqi uh, uh, prosecution, uh, persecute, uh, prosecution. Uh, that is, the Iraqi leadership, the new Iraqi leadership that was put in place by the United States after the U.S.-led invasion and occupation of Iraq refused constant demands by the American military to give American soldiers legal immunity. And this tells you a great deal. I mean, this, the subtitle of my book is, is it the end of America's moment? That is, I mean, when you have an Iraqi leadership that was put in place by the United States after 2003 saying no to America, I mean, this tells you a great deal what's happening in the Middle East itself. At the end of the day, Barack Obama and the U.S. military had no choice but to bring all American forces out of Iraq. The Obama administration 
uh, had really no choice, even though that basically they wanted to maintain a sizable force in Iraq. The Iraqis said, no, sorry. And that's why now I think all American forces are out of Iraq. And I think the reason why I'm stressing uh, this important point about the reduction of American troops in Muslim lands, in contrast to his predecessor, I think Barack Obama fully appreciates the significance of bringing American troops home from Muslim lands. I think truly the presence of, 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 of Western boots on the ground in Muslim lands is not only a source of instability, is a great source of hostility. It's a great source. It has provided ammunition to militant and radicals who use the presence of American troops to say, look at America. America has inherited the legacy of colonialism. America is engaged in a colonial project in the heart of the Muslim world. But to mention the fact that basically maintaining a sizable huge force basically uh, is very costly. We just can't afford it, given what, what has transpired in the last uh, 11, 12 years. I mean, we, we have spent ourselves almost to uh, bankruptcy uh, since 9-11. Uh, uh, Obama's outreach to the Muslim world, I think, on the whole, has been also a uh, uh, mixed success. Uh, uh, I think uh, many people in that part of the world have come to the conclusion that Barack Obama does not really mean what he says, what he said in, in Ankara, what he said in Cairo, what he said in Jakarta. Many people in that part of the world believe that Barack Obama, there's a huge divide between his rousing rhetoric and the realities on the ground. Uh, I don't think the outreach has been harmful. All I'm suggesting is that Barack, the, the great speeches given by Barack Obama in uh, Turkey and in Cairo and Indonesia really have not basically been translated into concrete policies on the part of the president for a variety of reasons. I'll say a few words. Uh, and there is a widespread belief in that part of the world that Barack Obama really has not brought about major changes in American foreign policy. And they are correct. The reality is Barack Obama has never said that he was a different type of president on foreign policy. Barack Obama has never claimed to be a transformational president in terms of foreign policy. That is, up to a year before, well, less than a year before the ouster of President uh, Husni Mubarak of Egypt. Mubarak was in Washington, and in a press conference, President Barack Obama looked at Mubarak and he said, this is the wise man of the Middle East. When we need advice, he looked straight on camera and he said, we basically call on our wise man, wise friends, in order to uh, get advice on the Middle East. You can imagine what that statement, how the statement itself resonated back in Egypt, and many commentators in Egypt basically questioned Barack, Barack Obama's basically, I mean, uh, uh, embrace of Mubarak, who was perceived or he was seen uh, as a dictator and tormentor of his own uh, people. What's interesting, though, what's interesting about what has been happening in the Arab world in the last 15 months or so, the, the so-called the Arab Spring uh, uprising, is that really people in that part of the world have moved on. Uh, I think if there is one particular point I want to stress about Barack Obama's outreach to Muslims is that he has been successful in shifting the debate in really from foreign policy to domestic politics. And, and that's by itself. That is, uh, 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 the reality is the Obama presidency has become the process of normalization of relations with the Muslim world. What we have seen in the last 15 months, I mean, think of what are the rallying cries of millions of Arabs in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Egypt, in what are they? They're not about Western colonialism. We have not seen any American flags burned. We have not seen any calls for the creation of other Islamic Emirates. We have not seen any, basically, flags of Al-Qaeda flying in Arab capitals. We have seen calls for what? Effective citizenship, bread and butter, separations of power, and effective citizenship, and of course, elections, fair elections. And this by itself, I think a testament, a testament to the fact that people in that part of the world has moved on, that America is no longer seen as the omnipotent power that basically dabbles in everything else. And that's a positive thing. I think this is a, a I would argue, I'm giving credit to President Barack Obama because he has indirectly succeeded in basically 
contributing to the shifting of the debate from foreign policy, insidious, poisonous foreign policy, where the United States was, this, was seen as in the thick of everything, to basically saying, well, look, we embrace, we welcome, uh, and we embrace your aspirations, but it's, you own it. You must take ownership of uh, your own revolts. Uh, what he said is basically what he did in this particular sense, he, kept, he has kept a healthy distance from the Arab Spring uprisings, and this is by itself, I think, a major development, a major development that tells me we might be really entering a new era of relations. Of course, it's going to take many years, but I see it as a positive sign in the historical relationship between the United States and that part of the world. I see people really now are beginning to focus on the domestic tormentors as opposed to blaming the United States and the West for the ills and misfortunes that have befallen uh, the world uh, since the beginning uh, of the Cold War. And even though, I mean, of course, this is just the beginning, but the reality is, the reality is, truly, this is a significant historical moment. It represents a major psychological rupture in that part of the world. And even though there's a great deal of turmoil, even though there's a great deal of dust, please don't be blinded by the dust. When the dust settles, and it will, might take a decade or two, a new world, a new universe will be born in the same way as the great revolutions. You know, talking about whether it's in France in the 1790s or what have you, the various revolutions, a new universe will be born. It might take a decade or so, but one point for some of you, and I really, I, I really stress, we should not view that part of the world as unique and exceptional. The whole idea, the whole idea of exceptionalism, that democracy is alien to that part of the world, it really is a myth, a figment of our imagination. One of the major lessons that we have learned, I myself humbly have learned the lesson, is that we have ignored the role of agency. The role of agency, despite authoritarianism, despite, I mean, the, the iron and the blood imposed on the people, I mean, think of what's happening now in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, despite the turmoil, despite the oppression, people are rising up. They're demanding freedom, they're de demanding respect, dignity, separations of power, and of course, effective uh, citizenship. Uh, let me qualify what I said. Even though Barack Obama has embraced the Arab revolts, if there is really one speech I really would like you to read or listen to is his May uh, 11, uh, 2000, uh, uh, his, uh, May 11, 2011 at the State Department, in which I think he uh, wholeheartedly embraced the Arab Revolt, and he said he directed uh, all institutions of the U.S. government to basically uh, 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 view and try to work with the Arab Revolt, the Arab transitioning Arab societies, in order to help them uh, uh, in their uh, transitional uh, phase. I think even though he rhetorically embraced the Arab revolts, unfortunately, the president has not really offered any concrete measures, any economic measures, any really real measures to help the uh, uh, oppressed uh, uh, democratic uh, transitioning societies make the transition. This is a very important point. I'm not suggesting that we're talking about American money. No one is suggesting that the United States has either the money to give the biggest cash flow in the world is not in China, is not in Japan, is not in India. The biggest cash flow in the world is in that part of the world, in the Gulf. I'm talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's not about American money uh, 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 trying to really be invested in that part of the world. We're talking about leadership. You need global leadership in order to really raise the money from that part of the world and invest it in real projects, in trying reconstruction. That's what I'm talking about. And in fact, on this question of leadership, unfortunately, the president is really engaged at home, is engaged in the Pacific Ocean. The reality is the Middle East is not really a top foreign policy priority for uh, Barack Obama. And that's why we have not seen any concrete measures on the part of the president in order to help transitioning societies in uh, uh, Tunisia, in Morocco, in Egypt, in Yemen, and other places. I said I started my the, the assessment, taking stock of the Obama, I said, the reducing the American military presence is one of Barack Obama's major political achievements. Uh, one of 
Obama's greatest uh, political uh, shortcomings, uh, as you well know, has been the failure to help broker a Palestinian-Israeli settlement. And that's not, I, I don't say it very lightly here, because Barack Obama and the American government have already, I said, have, have uh, uh, conceptualized the Palestinian-Israeli, the Arab-Israeli conflict as part of the strategic national security interests of the United States. The first telephone call that President Barack Obama made when he came, the first telephone call on the first day was the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in which he promised to help broker a Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace settlement, to help broker, to bring about an independent Palestinian state that lives peacefully along a uh, Jewish uh, state. He has invested considerable political capital trying to basically bridge the divide between the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Palestinian leadership. One of the major lessons that I really flesh out in my book about why the United States has failed to broker a peace settlement is that one of the big points is that I'm talking about institutional continuity in American foreign policy. That the reality is if you really want to understand why American foreign policy, uh, why the constant failure of American foreign policy when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict because there is an institutional structural continuity. And one of the points, one of the major points I made earlier, I said Barack Obama is fully anchored with the consensus on American foreign policy. Let me translate what I mean by institutional continuity. That is, the reality is there's a consensus on the Arab-Israeli uh, in the United States. And this is not, you've heard a great deal about the lobby. I don't buy the idea that somehow the Israeli lobby moves everything. This is the easiest way not to explain things to say the Israeli lobby is responsible for this and the Israeli lobby is responsible for that. It's nonsense. The lobby is important, but it's not the whole story. There is what we call the American political system. The American political system that includes special interest groups, that includes the Congress, that includes a consensus. What we, the way we view the world, the way we look at the Middle East, the way we look at the Middle East is through the lens, the Israeli lens. That's the reality. Uh, three times, three major confrontations between Barack Obama and Benjamin Netanyahu, three major confrontations, public confrontation. I'm not saying anything. Barack Obama caved in and lost the three major confrontations uh, uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu insults the president publicly in the White House, on cameras. He goes to the Congress and he receives dozens of standing ovations. That is the reality. The reality is Barack Obama could have challenged this particular consensus. Barack Obama could have basically stood up to Benjamin. He decided not to do so because Barack Obama does not believe, as I mentioned earlier, Barack Obama subscribed to this particular consensus, and he realized the political costs associated with standing up to Benjamin Netanyahu. And also, it's not, so it's, we're talking about what I call the, one of the, the arguments I make in the book is that the institutional continuity, the structural continuity that defines the American political system is much more complex than just the lobby. It's really, it's much bigger than the lobby. It's a combination of basically world views that have been entrenched over many, many years. And all presidents, most presidents, with the exception of Eisenhower uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, during the, the Suez crisis, are they subscribed to this particular consensus? That the whole idea that Israel is a tiny state in a sea of hostility, insecure state that somehow cannot lower its guards the Muslim world is very hostile, and if Israel lowers its hostility, it will be swept away and devoured. Barack Obama, if you, if you read his speech at the United Nations in September 2011, he basically articulated this particular, when he caved in, he, he made the speech is that, look, yes, we embrace the democratic aspirations of the Arab people, but the Palestinians, a different story. The Palestinians have to wait and negotiate with Benjamin Netanyahu, even if Benjamin Netanyahu basically does what? Keeps expanding the settlements. 
I mean, in, in the book, I say it's like saying to a person, let's negotiate over pizza. But the pizza is being devoured. And by the time we, we, we reach the pizza, there will be no pizza because Palestinian land truly. Okay, I'm telling you, this is a serious matter, and I would be delighted to answer any questions. The whole idea of a two-state solution is disappearing before our eyes. In fact, the right wing in Israel is doing exactly what the national interest of the Jewish community in Israel basically does not really want because they are, they are basically hammering a deadly nail in the coffin of a two-state solution. That's the historic irony and tragedy of what's happening on the West Bank now is that Netanyahu and the, white, the right wing lot are doing basically more harm to the idea of a two-state solution and basically canceling the whole idea and, and at the end of the table sooner rather than later the only thing we're going to have is one state solution and that would be the historic irony of history. Not only, I mean, just the, the whole idea of a, the American dysfunctional system, and I, 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 I say it with a heavy heart because I, 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 I don't like to criticize Barack Obama, but Barack Obama is a timid decision maker. Uh, that's who he is. Uh, uh, he really does not stand up to the convictions. Of, of, uh, but the reality is when he is confronted by challenges, he caves in. Uh, it's not just on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, 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 th that is the reality, uh, and that's why, basically, that he lost, basically, a great deal of capital uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict, and that's why nothing will happen on the Arab-Israeli conflict till uh, the next uh, presidency. But the reality is, I think, the failure, the, the, the failure on the peace process tells us a great deal about the institutional structural continuity of American foreign policy, and really the role of the president is really important but we should not exaggerate the whole idea of the imperial presidency. But the system itself is much more defining. It's much more shapes how presidents really function because they convince themselves and their advisors convince them that if you revolt against the consensus, basically your future will be online. Because presidents, I, like all of us, they're ambitious politicians. They want to be uh, uh, elected. How much time do I have? Do I have five minutes or? Five more minutes and then we'll get to the Iran. Iran is a gamble now, a as you well know. I mean, it could really go either a breakthrough in negotiations with Iran or we might find ourselves at war next year. Really 50-50%. Remember where Barack Obama, on the first day, he said, I will engage the Iranian leadership and I am willing to sit down and talk to the Iranian leadership. Where are we today? In fact, relations between Iran and the United States are much more, uh, at this particular point, uh, in fact, relations between Iran and the United States under Barack Obama have deteriorated much more than they were under President W. Bush. That basically, I mean, think of the drums of wars in the last few months. Literally, we are really, I mean, on, on, at the brink of a major confrontation with Iran. Uh, not only rapprochement, I mean, the, 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 the really rapprochement, the, the, the odds were against it for a variety of reasons. But in fact, Barack Obama was forced to put himself in a bind now. Because if the Iranian leadership, if the Iranian leadership does not really accept, does not really make the concessions demanded of it, Barack Obama has put himself in a bind that, the, that he said he will basically uh, carry out military strikes against Iran. If Iran decides Iran has not built a nuclear bomb, Iran has not made a decision to build a nuclear bomb, Iran has still has uh, uh, a while to build a nuclear bomb. But if Iran makes a decision to build a nuclear bomb, Barack Obama now is on record saying, I will basically uh, 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 order uh, military strikes against Iran, and that would mean uh, basically uh, why the failure on Iran? I mean, I think from day one, as I mentioned, really what we have learned from the WikiLeaks documents is that Barack Obama talked softly to the Iranian leadership, but he maintained the big stick, the sanctions. He never, he never even promised to basically reduce the sanctions against the Iranian leadership. That's point one. Point two, Barack Obama has faced stiff resistance by what we call the institutional bureaucratic I mean, uh, uh, infrastructure in the United States. Not only from the conservatives, by the way. The pressure on Barack Obama 
was ousted from the, within his own Democratic Party. I mean, literally, the top uh, uh, allies of Barack Obama were uh, exerted considerable pressure on Barack Obama from day one not to engage the Iranian leadership and not to soften America's uh, approach to uh, Iran. So Barack Obama, he came under pressure from both the conservatives and the Democratic Party to basically not to change course vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Again, I don't need to tell you about Israel and its allies in the United States and what they have done in the last three years and a half in order to exert pressure on Barack Obama not to basically make any concession to the Iranian leadership. Consistent pressure, overwhelming pressure, institutional pressure, uh, not just Israel and its allies, the Gulf states. Think of what Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Tremendous pressure on Barack Obama uh, in order to maintain the hardline approach against uh, Iran. So, I mean, think of where the president was. I mean, again, the president is, is a man made of, of, I mean, blood and flesh. He realized that this is a very costly matter. He not only has to take on I mean, the Republicans, he also has to take on the Democratic, his, his, mo his closest Democratic allies in the Congress, not to mention special interest groups here, not to mention America's most important ally in the Middle East, Israel, not to mention America's most important economic partner in the Middle East, that is Saudi Arabia. I mean, the king of Saudi Arabia was telling Barack, the president, basically, I want you to cut the head of the snake. He referred to Iran as the head of the snake. But I think this would be misleading to tell you that it's just we are responsible, the United States responsible. At the end of the day, I would argue that the responsibility that the Iranian leadership is as, in fact, more at fault for frustrating Barack Obama's approach to uh, basically rapprochement with Iran. I mean, I, I, again, I don't need to tell you that the Iranian leadership has mastered the art of making enemies. It's not only uh, uh, not farsighted, uh, but fragmented and uh, very fragmented decision-making process. Uh, the Iranian leadership has never helped Barack Obama basically try to convince, I mean, the American public that there is something really to go for and engage the Iranian leadership. Uh, and the reality is the Iranian leadership never trusted Barack Obama to deliver on a rapprochement. So here a combination of factors, both domestic and also international, and also the role of Iran itself, basically frustrated Barack Obama's humble initiative to, to bring about a uh, rapprochement uh, with Iran. And that's why Barack Obama uh, uh, forced himself uh, to um, uh, a bind. He has no exit strategy now. Finally, on the question of uh, uh, terrorism and al-Qaeda. I mean, I think on this part, Barack Obama has never wavered an iron fist against al-Qaeda and against terrorism. He basically has given the national security apparatus a carte blanche. You do whatever you want, anything you want. Uh, that he is using drones, using special operation forces, anywhere in the world, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan. In fact, the Pakistani uh, theater is much more important than the Afghan theater in the war against al-Qaeda. In this particular sense, I think Barack Obama has been much more, I mean, much more lethal and deadlier than President uh, Bush and the new conservatives. Of course, the new conservatives talked a great deal about in the fight, in the war against, I mean, uh, al-Qaeda. Yet in, in three years uh, and a half, I think I don't need to tell you, al-Qaeda has been dismantled. The last chapter in my book is titled, In for a Penny, In for a Pound. Um, and it's an English saying. I don't know if, if it, it, in for a penny, in for a pound, that means my hope that if Barack Obama is elected, he will have the courage in his second administration to stand up for his convictions, to challenge the dysfunctional American system, to really try very hard in order to basically be the great president that many of us uh, believe that he has the capacity to be, in, not just in terms of domestic politics, but in terms of uh, foreign policy, uh, to really provide global leadership uh, uh, and, and make the United States, I mean, uh, take risks on the aspirations and the dreams and hopes of millions of people in that part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a basic question on the process of foreign policy decision making. You talk constantly about Barack Obama's policy, his stands, his views, his pressures, but you haven't talked about the State Department. 
Uh, you mentioned the Secretary of State's name once, and that was in response to a question. You talked a bit about uh, pressures from Congress. Uh, you may have underestimated the pressures. I wonder if you would talk more about the role of Secretary of State Clinton of the State Department bureaucracy, which has very, very strong historical views on the whole Middle East. It does, and, and by the way, I really, in my book, I flesh out the institutional debates within the American foreign policy, not just the State Department, the Defense Department, the intelligence community, the Congress, the foreign policy broadly defined. And that's one of the arguments I, I try to make tonight is that there is an institutional constitu uh, continuity, structural continuity that takes into account the views of the various institutions. And in the Obama presidency, the reason why really I did not stress a great deal uh, the role of the State Department, because this is really a presidency, this particular administration is very much cohesive when it comes to the big issues on the Middle East itself. Uh, Secretary Clinton really does not differ with the president on the big question, the big challenges. And ironically, even the military, the military, this is the first time really in many, many years where the military really basically gone public. I mean, this is unusual when you have General Petraeus and the top generals coming out and saying, we believe that the president is absolutely correct, that a resolution in order to counterbalance the influence of special interest groups because they, they came out to the support of the president by saying, we believe that American, the American lives at stake, that the continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict has a direct effect, direct impact on uh, uh, the security of American soldiers. I mean, this is by itself, because usually it's unusual for a military generals to come out because they realized that the president needed some muscle and the military could really provide that particular muscle. So in this particular sense, really the military, the Defense Department, and the State Department have been, with the presidency, have been really on the same page. Uh, that is, because really, w I mean, I, I, I did not really flesh out because I don't have the time. I mean, just uh, Bill knows it's half an hour. The reality is when we talk about, when we say the, the peace settlement, I mean, there is a consensus on what a settlement, uh, will, it's a two-state solution that takes into account the security of the State of Israel, security of the Jewish state. I mean, this is set in stone. That is, and the State Department, the Defense Department, and the President on the same page with a demilitarized Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza with its capital in East Jerusalem. Again, there's no major disagreements. The whole the question really is, how do you go about it? How do you do it? That's really the, the debate. Um, and uh, uh, Hillary, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, she was the, the much more effective in really basically I mean, uh, dressing down Netanyahu when, when the Vice President Biden went to Jerusalem and was humiliated. The, I don't know if you remember the announcement about the expansion of settlement. She called Netanyahu and she basically exploded on the telephone. She said, dare you uh, insult the Vice President? Dare you? We sent him in order to. Uh, so she has been, uh, because what she could say, I mean, President Barack Obama cannot say what she can, because who she is and what she stands for and, and what have you. So the, really this, the reason why I did not really stress the role of the State Department and the Defense Department and the security and the, because there is a consensus within the American, I mean the institutions, about what kind of settlement. Question is, how do you deliver? Hi, you talked about uh, repairing trust being a central policy goal. How do drones fit into that? Um, are drones seen as better than boots on the ground or? No different? Thank you so much for asking this question because I, I, I spend a lot of time on the question of counterterrorism measures. Uh, I don't know if you know this, President Barack Obama has increased, I mean, by, I, I, I mean, there is tremendous escalation of the use of drones and the use of special operation forces violation of the sovereignty of nations in many places. Civilians are being killed probably you know, every time a drone because at the end of the day, you're shooting from far away and we know that thousands of civilians, according to <laughs> human rights groups, have been killed in Pakistan. And I really worry, a great, I really do. I really worry about the blowback effects. And earlier, Bill and I, and we were talking about Pakistan and I mean, think of how, I mean, th this is a real situation. I want you to know that technically we have been very effective in the use of counterterrorism measures. What we are really 
not taking into account is that will the blowback effects come to haunt us in one, two, three, four, five years? And how the various communities that are being basically injured and damaged by our actions might come to really uh, uh, take vengeance uh, 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 on Americans. And it's not just about the blowback effect. I mean, the whole idea is that now uh, you have counterterrorism measures beyond the supervision of the American legal process. Uh, that is now you're giving, I mean, the CIA and, and uh, basically is waging multiple wars in multiple theaters. As we talk in Yemen, open uh, war in Yemen, in Somalia and other uh, places. Uh, I'm not trying to underestimate the threat that some of the militants pose to the United States, but I also wonder, and I really do, whether the Obama foreign policy team and the American security apparatus are underestimating the long-term blowback effects and the legal ramifications when the United States of America basically uh, unleashes uh, the intelligence services to wage war beyond the control of the American legal system. So this is a real question, a re really, really question, because we, and I, I hope I am wrong, I really do. We don't wanna wake up a few years from now and say, how come we didn't know this? I want you to know in Pakistan, the biggest question in Pakistan when it comes to America is how America violates their sovereignty. In the same way, the killing of civilians in Afghanistan is a huge issue. In Yemen now, the, the use of American drones has emerged the killing of some militants and some civilians in Yemen. Um, and this is the dilemma faced by Barack Obama. He wants to bring American boots uh, from Muslim lands. At the same time, he wants to continue to wage counterterrorism war against militants, alleged militants, and real militants, uh, not taking into account also civilian casualties. I'm talking about 1,000 people have been killed as a result of the use of American drones. This is a serious question, and we don't have a debate on it. In fact, uh, one, once or twice, the use of drone has been acknowledged indirectly by, uh, uh, I mean, uh, officials in the State Department and the Defense Department, but this is a question we have not really had a big debate on it. Uh, because the question is that, you know, what choices do we have? Uh, and this particular question is very dear to the Vice President heart. Joe Biden is a big uh, buyer of the whole idea of the use of special operations and the drone wars, bring American troops home and let's unleash uh, war from, from the skies uh, on them. It's a serious question, it's a big question, it's a significant question, and really it has not received adequate attention and debate in the United States, and thank you for asking this question. Thank you. Very thank, you. thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.